Mahasa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samha Sambudasa Purang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami The uh, broad metta meditation, I think it's a beautiful one, um, but like to counterbalance it sometimes with a piece of advice Ajahn Jayasaro gives, which is when he goes to airports, he'll pick out each person he passes or as many as he can and think of an individualized metta wish for them. So if he sees someone with big ears, he'll say, I hope no one ever makes fun of that person for their big ears. And I find sometimes it's actually very helpful to narrow it down. It's a good practice. So, when I was uh, about 10 years old, my parents invited a refugee from Sarajevo to live with us. And he'd been smuggled out of the siege in Sarajevo in the back of a truck. And he arrived, and he was one of the most uh, bright beings I'd ever met. Just such love and uh, a certain care and compassion, which had somehow been forged um, in his difficulty and in just a, a loving family. He went on to work for uh, a variety of world-renowned nonprofits, met the Dalai Lama, and he had a child later in his life. And the child had um, a severe disability. And initially, he and his wife were distraught and didn't know what to make of the situation. There was a lot of suffering. And then I met him several years later and his little girl had grown up to be about 10 years old. And she wasn't able to do exactly everything that the other children in her class were. And she required a great deal of care. But I've never seen a parent and a child so close. And this, our friend, he said that he felt like she'd been given to him to teach him, I think, something like what it meant to love. She was there purely uh, to show what, what love meant to him. And just seeing the relationship between them and how what on the surface or on paper would look like a obstacle or maybe even in some people's minds a, a tragedy, a difficulty, turned into the largest blessing of this person's life. And so often I feel like this is how things work. And it's the true power, I believe, of the Christian concept of grace. That word is the most beautiful word I know in the English language. And I believe until uh, it's important for us Theravada Buddhists with our lists and the uh, refined but sometimes intellectual teachings to understand what grace means in our own lives and practices and hearts. And the word means many things, but one of the most, uh, the Christians will speak about the graces given to one, which are those moments that are almost landmarks or guideposts in your life, the footprint you step into that feels like it was made for you. I've had a, a few such moments. The first time I read Siddhartha and saw the image of the Buddha, there was a sense of golden light and just a feeling of recognition. That was a moment of grace. The first time I followed a monk on alms round in Ubon, um, that was a moment of grace. And the more you practice, the more you realize that your life is filled with these moments of grace. They're gifts, but the most powerful meaning, I think, of that word deals with 
the moments of grace, which are gifts that we don't, they're so unexpected and come from places we don't understand because they come from the deepest realms of tragedy and difficulty, the dark night of the soul, the valley of death, whatever you want to call it, but so often grace, the gifts that are the largest, require us to first go down on our knees and then something comes to you and raises you up. And to me, this is the most powerful meaning of that word. And it's a meaning uh, infused with a poetry, which is important because this is, I think, where much of the mystery of, of life lies and also the quintessential um, movement in the life of a spiritual practitioner because we have no trouble turning towards happiness and well-being, but human existence is hard. What we can learn from human existence is to understand pain and difficulty. And when we are able to turn towards that uh, completely, then we're able to find on the other side of it something much bigger than we thought, much more majestic and, and holy. So to begin speaking about that, it's important to make the distinction in Buddhism between two kinds of dukkha, suffering. Many of you will know this word. It's etymologically related uh, to du means bad, and ka is the hole into which an axle was put. So it's uh, a bad axle, a bad wheel. It's always slightly off and wobbly. Life is always a little wobbly. It's always falling apart. There's always something amiss. And it can range every, from everywhere from a slight stress to the, the deepest realm of suffering. It's a fascinating word, dukkha. And there's the dukkha of the first dart, the dukkha of the three characteristics, um, the fact that all things in the conditioned realm in our lives are changing, impermanent, uh, suffering, and not self. They're not under our complete control. They're not worth taking on as me and mine. And whenever we tie our hearts to them, then there's always a chance they'll break and break the heart. And this is just the situation. An arahant, an enlightened being, will also encounter this kind of dukkha. And one can experience that fractured nature of life with poignancy and poise and compassion. And one of the largest movements in spiritual practice is one from feeding off of the world and trying to find refuge in that realm of swirling conditionality to one of understanding it as a path towards awakening, a lesson, and a chance to bless. We move from feeding to blessing. And then there's the second dukkha, uh, second uh, concept of dukkha, which is the uh, dukkha of the Four Noble Truths. So this is the suffering that comes from craving, from unwholesome thirst, from attachment. It's how we become drunk on anger, how we become drunk on greed, how we tie our hearts to things we know are unworthy of our hearts, how we try to feed, how we try to find happiness and are disappointed in that and happiness trying to be gained through feeding always falls short. So, this aspect of dukkha is part of, of life, and um, no matter how much we ignore it, uh, it's one of the quintessential pieces. So, the idea of grace, to be able to move through it, the any teaching that doesn't touch on the Four Noble Truths is in some sense incomplete. So to reiterate those four, they're best articulated by the tasks that accompany them. So one is uh, encouraged to uh, comprehend dukkha, to let go of its source, craving, to realize cessation of dukkha or peace, and to develop the path to that cessation, the Noble Eightfold Path. And um, the uh, 
when we're able to turn towards dukkha with those four truths in mind, we find that if we're really able to look at our suffering, then we find in it the ability to let go. And on the other edge of that, there is a grace. There is the third noble truth of peace. There is a sense of release and a hidden majesty. And you can feel this so easily when you've become involved in some uh, inner argument and you're suddenly able to let it go and you realize it's not really a problem or uh, the anger dissolves and you find that there's um, a spaciousness on the other end. The best or the largest problems in life are rarely solved, they just dissolve. And that happens through the Four Noble Truths. The first noble truth is the dark valley. It's turning towards pain, pain. And it's learning to see the craving, the second arrow we're adding onto it and letting go of that. And we find that when you let go of something you're clinging to with tight hands, that your palms fill with sunlight. That's the secret, is that when you let go, you're not left with nothing. You're left with something much bigger. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. um, so the... This is, this is Buddhist grace, is the movement through the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and the Buddha gave us, so how do we orient towards suffering so we have time to comprehend it? Because it doesn't happen uh, easily. To turn towards uh, the difficulty in life is the strangest and most counterintuitive part of uh, movement of the heart we could imagine, and yet it is essential. And so the Buddha really provided uh, terms and tools for this. The one that he raises up the most uh, firmly and right off the bat is patient endurance, so kanti. And he famously said that kanti is the supreme incinerator of defilement, patient endurance. The translation is problematic because it implies this gritting one's teeth and just bearing through. And sometimes that is what it means, is you realize that for the heart to let go of something it's feeding off of or clinging to, sometimes you just have to feel the burn quite a few times. And Longpur Cha said that 70% seven, of the practice was knowing you should let go of something and not being able to. So there is this point of encountering again and again these patterns, these people, these difficulties, and just feeling their burn time after again, time and again. Ajahn Achilo tells the story of being at Wat Mapjan where I ordained. And one day he was just suffering too much and uh, put his anksa, his little monk shirt, over his head and uh, just kind of yelled into it. And then he went and saw Longpur Anand and said, when will it get any better? And Longpur said, in five years, it'll be a little bit better. <laughs> so it's slow and, and it's not at all. Um, I also remember my mom, after a few years of practice, she said, I don't understand. Retreats don't seem to affect me like they used to. And then she realized it was because her whole life had become much like retreat. The distinction had faded. This path is profound. It shifts you. We're so used to mapping our progress in life along an X and Y axis. And suddenly it's like you add a Z axis and you're moving through a whole new strata of experience and the heart. And it's hard to see at first until you realize things have gradually brightened. So it's slow, but it's not slow. So part of it is learning to let go of that burning. But that's not a small thing. To be able to sit through uh, difficulty, to watch those patterns come up and not to feed them or feed on them and watch them burn themselves out. Meditation is some call, sometimes called sitting in the fire. But comet, kanti, patient endurance, means much more. We can also approach it as a quality of grace or with a quality of, of grace. The word, the root of kanti is kam, which means forgiveness. So there's this aspect of can you forgive your experience for being like it is right now? Can you forgive yourself? And so often, what phrase actually helps you remain still and centered through difficulty is a phrase like, you're doing just fine. You're doing OK. That's worth saying to yourself quite often. You're doing OK. And 
the other translation is fortitude. Or Long Por Sumedho says, patient endurance is peaceful coexistence with the unwished for. So there's an aspect of not just gritting one's teeth, but awareness itself is accepting. It holds difficulty. And it has a sense of almost metta, equanimity, equipoise. This is how we can orient towards suffering, is sometimes we realize that these things keep coming, and just to remain with them is worth a great deal. And sometimes it's easy enough to really turn towards the large sufferings in our life, the real difficulties. You can kind of pinpoint and really say, this is something I'm working with. But so often it's the slight threads, the not knowing exactly what to do next, the malaise, the ennui. Um, that really can, over time, crust over the heart. And sometimes the sense of just waiting, being patient with yourself until a path emerges. There's a, there's a room for this word of Kanti. And sometimes there's a place for surrender where you just acknowledge it's like this. Longpur Buddha Dasa said that if he could take one book to a desert island, it would be a little amulet that he'd wear around his neck that said, it's like this. I really like that. That was his book. So, but the Buddha gave us other tools. Because sometimes you have to lean into the wind of dukkha to really remain or attuned to it, to really be able to comprehend it and therefore let go of the suffering associated. And so there's the tool of faith. And um, there's a story I tell sometimes of, uh, well, we won't go into that yet. But the Buddhist word faith, we don't actually have a word that means faith. It's uh, the word sada, which means everything from confidence to faith to trust. And Buddhist, Buddhist sada is really interesting because unlike many religions, the ability to practice is not this predicated on a binary of belief of some thing or someone as a savior or a certain book. Rather, the Buddha, when he was confronted with people who doubted the path and the teaching, like in the Kalama Sutta, he said, it's true, you should be doubtful of this. This is a doubtful matter. But what do you think, Kalamas, when you practice what is wholesome, uh, when you let go of greed, hatred, and aversion, does your life improve? Um, do you find that leads to happiness? And they said, yes, uh, these qualities are praised by the wise. So he points us back to our own experience. And they say that the beginning point of wisdom is the thought, what, when I do it, leads to my long-term benefit and happiness. So there's really the sense that sada can be as, as minimal as... Uh, unassuming as simply the belief that we can change our own hearts, that our actions have effects, and that if we practice, maybe something good will happen. Maybe we can awaken a little more. It can be the confidence of a scientist in a hypothesis such that they're willing to put it to the test. And the beauty about the path is so many aspects of it are about praxis. You can test these teachings. You can sit, you can meditate. You can see what happens when you watch the mind and develop loving kindness. But sada can mean much more. It's like a map where you look at these teachings and see over time that the map that the Buddha laid out says, here there's a tree, here there's a river. And you practice with these teachings and you find time and again it's true. The Buddha says, there's a tree, and there's a tree. There's a river, there's a river. And over years, your confidence in this map maker builds. And then sometimes, maybe at the edge of the map, there's uh, you know, a set of high mountains. And you've never seen mountains before. This is Ajahn Jayasaro's analogy. But there comes a point where you think the map maker has been right so many times. Maybe there are, maybe mountains do exist. Um, so it's an informed trust. And there's a beautiful sutta called the Chanki Sutta, uh, Majjhima Nikaya 95, where a kind of a rebellious Brahmin comes to the Buddha and says, what is truth? And 
Uh, he asserts truth based on lineage of teaching, um, on the fact that he has certain approval in teachings. And the Buddha says, look, one protects truth. You know, it's some things one are passed down through unbroken lineage, but they remain false. And one protects truth by saying, uh, if one has faith in something, one says, I have faith, but does not yet come to the conclusion, only this is true, everything else is false. If one approves of a teaching, one protects pr truth by saying, I approve of this, but one does not come to the conclusion, only this is true, everything else is false. And this is the root to the restraint of the Buddha in that case, to say that when we have faith, we acknowledge we don't really know. Uh, we just have faith, and we say that as much. And this is kind of the root to world peace, is everyone gets together and says, yeah, we're not really sure. We think this is true, but we're not certain. This is Buddhist-informed faith. And then in the end, Chanki, this Brahmin, asks, what is the final arrival at truth? And the Buddha says, it's awakening. And the point is that if you arrive at purity of heart, you don't need to preach it. You don't need to prove it to others. And it's harmless. This is the end result. And that's the only point where confidence can truly be unshakable, is you've seen the deathless. But that's a very safe faith. But that's not enough, because as you practice, the deeper emotions of the heart do come into play, and there is a sense of love. And there's a union substrate to the psyche that speaks in the language of symbols, of ritual, of story. And this is the power of the faith that is so triggering to a modern secular Buddhist. We have a shrine here. It's just a Buddha image. It's just a block of wood. But it's a technology because those forces in the heart those deep forces of love, of care, of a true hunger for awakening, they speak in the language of embodiment. And so we use it. And it's not cheapened by that. We bow not because we think this image is anything in and of itself, but we're bowing to the ideal of awakening embodied externally. These are powerful technologies. And the first, you know, people often ask, like, as a monastic, did you? You know, what do you, don't you miss love and all these things? And I do miss Hugh Grant movies. I really loved Hugh Grant, um, but not that much. And one of the secrets is that you begin to encounter beings who are the most pure you've ever met. And that, the sense of love that upwells from that is the most real love I've ever touched. That's faith too. Faith, sada, is confidence, but it can be much more. It can be trust. It can be love. And this is the container, often, that lets us hold ourselves still and turn towards suffering long enough. Maybe things are hard. Maybe life has its tragedy, and it does. But can we have faith in awakening and turning towards these Four Noble Truths in that if we continue to walk straight, if we continue to apply the Four Noble Truths, trying to understand dukkha, um, letting go of the thirst which causes it, our attachment, learning to see and uh, appreciate the moments of peace, and then developing the wholesome and loving heart, the path. Can we, um, this is what lets us move past and find something that's beyond dukkha. There's a teacher named Chongyam Trungpa, and I've told this story a few times, but he was visiting some Tibetan monasteries with an entourage of lamas. And many of the Tibetan monasteries have these large Tibetan mastiffs that guard it. And one of the mastiffs broke off its chain and charged the entourage. And whereas all the other monastics fl uh, fled, Chogyam Trungpa, who's a problematic figure in many respects, charged the mastiff, and it got scared, and it ran away from him. And sometimes, to really turn towards and comprehend dukkha, to really remain present with suffering such that we can touch the grace that often lies on the other end of it, we have to turn towards it as understand the gift that lies on the other end of it. The way through is down. 
the way past is down. And this uh, means gratitude. Uh, to understand that the figures in our life who are the most difficult, the pains we have, the difficult issues, the tragedies, often these are exactly, exactly where our attachment hides. And it's these particular points that let us develop a true breadth of heart, true patience, um, qualities of love. These are our teachers. Without them, we become complacent, we become careless. Without difficulty, without friction with the external realm, there's no impetus for the knowing element, for the heart to separate itself from the conditioned realm. We tie ourselves and weave ourselves into the cloth of this fraying fabric of world. And it's a cheapening. What's in us, the heart, is, has the potential to be luminous, bright, untouchable. You meet people like this who are utterly selfless, utterly unshakable. And what a gift that time and again, the woof and cloth of the world frayed such that the silver threads of their hearts were able to stand out and be taken in hand and nourished. So when the, when the world falls apart, it's fall, you know, one can really see it as falling apart for the sake of seeing what lies underneath. And instead of looking at karma as this hand of retribution, suffering as this hand of retribution, the difficulties in our life as this obstacle or hand of retribution, can we look at it as a gentle hand offering us exactly the lesson, exactly the breadth of heart we need to see? And it personifies it. Um, you know, you can say the Dharma is trying to teach you a lesson. It's showing you exactly what you need. But the beauty of faith in the Four Noble Truths is that they are a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you turn towards your suffering as a gift, if you completely bow to it, and sometimes you don't get to sort of, quote unquote, work with your suffering. Sometimes the biggest tragedies in life are too big to hold in this sterile conception of your meditation practice. Sometimes your duty is to remain still and present and let that difficulty wash over you and work on you and surrender. But if you're able to hold still through that um, and turn towards it, then it becomes a gift because you're able to see the craving, because you're able to let go, because you're able to find that when the anger fades, when the tragedy fades, when the difficulty ceases, as all difficulties do because they're impermanent, on the other end of that, there's a majesty of spirit and you realize that you are not this world, you are not tied to these things, that you have inner resources to give and to bless the world with. And the more you do that, the more you apply this flywheel of the Four Noble Truths, um, the more you see the heart refine. And this is the beauty of, of, of Buddhism, is that even when the faith isn't present, even when you're hopeless, Ajahn Chah would say, when you feel like practicing, you practice. When you don't feel like practicing, you practice. And even when the faith isn't there, when the third or fourth noble truth aren't present, peace and the path, you always have the first. You can always find suffering. And that's still the path. And it, that's part of our path, is seeing that. And seeing time and again that this is where grace appears, is when you turn towards dukkha, when you really place careful hands on it and acknowledge that this is, the body connects to others through pleasure, the heart connects through pain. There is a reason the Buddha put dukkha first. And one perhaps way we can hold that is the fact that when you touch your own suffering, you touch all beings suffering. When you, a mother is estranged from her daughter, when an addict recovers, when you fail, you are touching a much lar larger cloth. And without that trailing thread that leads you back there, the heart becomes porcelain. So can you let the kind of the crust of the ego and self crack just such that you're able to actually 
touch a much larger um, piece of the world. This is your gift. This is how you develop true empathy. And the largest sufferings in life often have to be approached that way. There's a mother who, uh, Frank Ustaseski tells this story, her toddler got hit by a car. And as she was driving back from the morgue, this voice came into her head and it said, you cannot let this break you. And so she spent the rest of her life counseling other parents who had lost children. And who else could speak to their suffering? So when you encounter these, understand this is your route to something much bigger, to a common ground of humanity and to a greater compassion. And life can just be a sort of blind movement through things that are good enough. But what a cheap use of a life. And if you turn towards the difficulties in your life as a chance to really develop something much greater, to touch into a, a, a greater cloth, there's grace there. And you find that the greatest gems are hidden where it was darkest. And it's poetic language, but it's true. And the Four Noble Truths, if held correctly, they are grace. Um, we touch and endure through the suffering of the First Noble Truth and come to the path and the peace, the majesty at the other side. So I wish you all the best in that journey. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. Some of the meditation was trying to figure out how to bring a squirrel into the grace talk. There was probably a way, but I didn't get it. <laughs> so um, we have a chance, huh? Oh, squirrel? Oh, well, thank you. Oh, well, the meditation, yes. Oh, thank you. What was your squirrel, Gary? It's okay. Sorry. I didn't mean to put you in the spot. It's all right. It's all right. No pressure. So um, we have a chance now for some questions and discussion. And we have uh, Ian Yannicke here as well, so we get to share the mic, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, so if people want to raise any hands, uh, we'll run a mic over to you. And... If anyone's on Zoom, raise your electronic hand or type your question into the chat and we'll call on you that way too. Gary? Um, let's bring a mic over to Gary. Oh, well, it's right there. That worked. Thank you. I just want to say that from my life, many pieces in it, even before I met any of you, I was taught to face into difficulty and especially in my marriage, and that was the context of the teaching, but so many times in my life and in my marriage, facing into the pain between my wife and me, things emerged, and I hear what you're saying about these things as grace. I could not see what the result would be, but it was life. It brought our hearts to life. It brought us to life, and it saved us from tremendous destruction. So I'm just speaking to echo in support of what you've just said. It comes out of very real life. Thank you, Gary. It's interesting talking about grace and suffering because it's really important to distinguish the two types because we can risk romanticizing suffering and wallowing in it. But I think if we make that clear distinction between the dukkha of the three characteristics, and then the, the, the dukkha that's ugly that we add on to it, then, then yeah, there's really an ability to, to hold these things exactly in that way. So thank you. I had kind of a sleepless night, so I missed some of what you said. But um, in 
from my Mahayana point of view, in terms of the three kinds of suffering, what I've always been taught is it's um, suffering of pain, suffering of change, and suffering of conditionality. And I was trying to transpose how that fit into what you were saying, like the Four Noble Truths. I couldn't quite get it. I wonder if you had any way to transpose them. Yeah, that's from the Dukkata Sutta. Um, so that's actually exactly canonical. Um, this distinction between the two types of dukkha I'm speaking to, it's more something extracted from the suttas and the commentaries. But I find it's a very useful distinction. And I've always, I have also wondered if those two map onto each other exactly. Um, I'd say that the dukkha of change is a first arrow dukkha. You know, things shift. Uh, the dukkha of conditionality, um, the fact that all things are kind of uh, rest, you know, conditioned by numerous different aspects and so can't hold completely, you know, aren't self-contained. I think that might be the meaning of, of that sort of dukkha. I can't remember. I think all three can relate to the first arrow, but uh, it's difficult because the dukkha of dukkha, you know, pain, that we compound. So that word really can refer to just like physical pain, even though an enlightened being doesn't have emotional or mental pain to top it off. But the word is still often used for also the second arrow, dukkha, like the added suffering from craving or not wanting the pain to be there. So it becomes a bit conjoined, not disjoined at a certain point too. I, did you want to speak to that? Cutting a pie in three pieces or two. A dukkha pie. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> we have a question on Zoom. I think it's Hasachito. Is that the case? Hi. Um, yeah, I have a question about um, about seeing dukkha as as grace or seeing suffering as a gift. I noticed that when when I'm not deep in suffering, it's easy for me to conceive of it that way. Um, but when I am deep in suffering, it's it's only it's so intolerable and only tolerable in that I have no choice but to tolerate it. And when I go between these two states, I feel like neither of them are quite right because when I'm not deep in the dukkha, it's very easy for me to just say, oh, it's just this, it's, it's fine and it's a gift and, and all of that. But it forgets, that mindset forgets the intensity with which it is possible to feel. Um, and can you speak to how I can bring that more in line in order to prepare myself for when it is bad? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, is that Daniel Hasachito? Okay, great. Um, sorry, you're teeny on the Zoom. We have your passport, Hasachito, by the way. <laughs> um, that's not good. Oh, it's okay. We'll mail it to you. We just found it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, once again, to really, it's always important to qualify that there is the danger of romanticizing dukkha as, as such. And in a Buddhist conception, the second arrow dukkha is not wholesome. And um, it's a gift insofar as it lets us learn to let go into a broader capacity of heart and it's the root to the third noble truth eventually. But I just, poetic language is powerful, but it's also inexact. So it's always important to frame it very carefully in the Buddhist teaching so we don't romanticize stress in an unwholesome way. But I'd say you're right. I think that's why the Buddha, like when you're in suffering, sometimes what you can do is stay still through it. And it's too intense to hold it in this way often. And I think that's why the Buddha raised up patient endurance, that simple, basic, non-romantic term as the supreme practice, because often that's really what you have. And I find that thing, when the seas are really rough, when there's a lot of uncertainty or pain, that's when you really have to just keep your head. There's sometimes when your whole duty and practice is just to keep your head down and not create any new karma based on the habit that's coming up, to not act on it. And um, 
and that's patient endurance. And I'd say that in those bright moments when you do have some perspective, when you are able to kind of think about difficulty or your difficulties in this way, that's when you really have to build a world and a container that can hold you through the deeper moments. And this is why the technologies of faith are so helpful. Like this is why you create a habit of coming into community every week or to bowing the first time you get up or to meditating every day, to having a confession partner, to having accountability, to having a shrine is because you need to create a world that holds you when you're weak. And I think that's really important to do. And I think that's important, this Buddhist idea of aditana, which means determinations. It's something we use a lot in Buddhism is saying, okay, for, for three, these three months, I'm, I'm done drinking. Or, um, you know, I'll meditate 30 minutes a day, six days a week from now on for, for this, you know, few months. And it's really important to take those moments when you get a breath of air and when your head's above the water and you see things clearly, is steer your life from those points and really make a lot of them. Like when you see, okay, I know this person's wholesome for me to see. I know I should be meditating this many times a day. I know I should go to the monastery. Then like when you have the capacity, make those plans, make those commitments. And then when you're in a weaker state, there's something to hold you when you're just kind of floppy and, and, and weak maybe. Um, I, uh, please. I'd agree with all of that, and I would add it's about our building resiliency. And as we're building the resiliency, we do that in the lower flow dukkha times usually, when there's enough capacity for us to um, investigate. So that's when the investigation aspect of it can be strong, and I can tease apart the, oh, the char these are the three characteristics, this is what is occurring here. It's like this, and I'm seeing the conditionality of it. It's where the wisdom components can grow. And we're building up the heart uh, to be able to look at the dukkha around us so that our compassion uh, muscles can also be stronger. And then as we go to the dukkha, 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 dukkha land, and we end up, you know, in serious straits, one of my teacher calls it the dumb ox meditation. And really all you're doing is you're just bearing with. You know, and and the, the ox's mind is not proliferating. It is just bearing with. And so as much as we cannot add, we, you know, it's like we don't have the capacity to tease out the characteristics and build the heart and these things. Although those muscles are actually getting stronger during that time too, if we're just bearing with. So it's a, it's a growth strategy. Uh, today, I had a little encounter. <laughs> uh, this little part of it. Um, I got off the bus. There was a whole, a whole range of things as to why the bus was late, da, 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 the police, blah, 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 et cetera. And so as I got off the bus, I wasn't as attentive my bag was still in the seat. And so I got off and then I realized, okay, my arm's not on me. So I try to you know, flag and I trip and I, it's, um, the ball is in my you know, chest, et cetera, et cetera. And it was interesting. It's like, hmm, there's this curiosity while I'm falling and hitting and the breath is gone and I'm getting scraped up and the bus is going and all of this, and I wasn't in the mental aspect of it. It was, it was truly, there was just the curiosity and the ouch and the, so there was the dukkha dukkha. But the other aspects of the dukkha, it was like, still, I was like, these are the characteristics, impermanence. Oh, that might be my laptop gone, <laughs> you know. It, and it could flash there, but it wasn't with this than catastrophizing. It was just like, oh, you know, luckily my passport is not in here, but that did flash through. Oh, there goes Thailand. <laughs> and it can be just that curiosity. Oh, I wonder if I'm going to, you know, unscrape or I have to sew the button back on my bowl or da-da-da. It was about curiosity, 
more than I'm suffering. And so the t I had enough tools that I could be present with and attending to and trying to think how do I, you know, all of the, the necessary thoughts and just to be with. And it was, it was humorous. It was, it was fun. <laughs> and I did reunite with my bag. I don't have to go on and on into further dukkha land where I might just need to be the dumb ox missing a Thailand trip. Um, so that's it. It's the building the resiliency so that we can show up and, and be amazed at how the practice helps us be with this moment until um, we don't have those dumb ox moments anymore, but go there when we need it. Adam, you want to get a mic? It's actually Noah. Sorry, Noah. I get the biblical stuff mixed up sometimes. I don't oh, know why. It's okay. It's all Genesis to me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind being called Adam. Um, the other day, I was taking a cold shower, and I had this sort of moment of revelation where I was like, to be to be able to like successfully take a cold shower and continue to do that, you have to be okay with the, the, the cold, you needed to be okay with that sensation. And then I realized that um, I could do that, I could be okay with it, and it actually did change how I felt and how I was able to handle it. Like, because before I think I would like kind of sort of go into like a panic, but I realized that that was just like emotional, and that there was this emotional aspect and then I started applying that to other circumstances that were painful or kind of emotionally, like, oh, I can't handle, where, where that feeling of like, oh, I can't handle this, I can't handle this right now. It's like, no, that's, it's okay. Does, and I really started to like, think that this was like brilliant but I just wanted to like, I wondered how y'all both felt about that. Yeah, please. Well, just don't get attached to the brilliance. Um. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> However, I think you're onto something. Uh, Cause yeah, a, a lot of life is taking cold showers. And sometimes we were choiceful in saying, okay, it's cold shower time. Uh, and sometimes the sky just opens. So I think that if it's a beautiful analogy, and I, I, I think I'm going to follow it too, but I'm not going to try to attach to it either. So, um, yeah, the experience of, and I think you probably can speak to the actualities of cold, cold showers more than I can, because that's, it's not my go-to practice. Um, but that, that experience in the body of, you know, literally a pulling or if, if you step into the shower and it's too hot too or whatever it's that there's a visceral pulling away and if you start to actually be in those moments and notice the body sensations that happen you will find they're happening in the cold showers of life too and so you can start to have a body-based awareness of what the first sign of i'm applying a second arrow the cold water is just a first arrow, but the second arrow, I'm doing the contracting and the pulling. And if you start to know my body does this when I go into that reactive mode, you can start to catch it at that, oh, I've just smacked, you know, I've just, without then, you've built some skills for dealing with it and you know how to relax, you know how to open, you know how to accept, you know how to smile. It's just cold water. It's just samsara. And it really, it's, it's a, an amazing skill, so I think you're on to something. I think it's brilliant. <laughs> People uh, haven't tried. I, I rarely meditate before taking a cold shower if I can help it. Here's a bit difficult, but in general, 
give it a go. Five minutes of a cold shower if you can, and then sit and see how it clarifies the breath energy. And if you really are suffering, then talk to talk to Noah. <laughs> so we have time for one more question, and then we have to wrap up. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, and I totally agree. Like from own experience, that sometimes to go through suffering, to go into it, is really the right way. Um, so my question is, um, how do you, so that's just with your own suffering, right? Practicing with your suffering, but then the suffering of others, and especially when it becomes like, like for example, like with, with all that's going on, you know, these days, um, all these things that you see, like, do you have any words for that, like practicing with that? As well, because I don't know how to like skillfully practice with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's a good question. I think first uh, acknowledging our, what it means to really be informed. Uh, how many times a day do we have to check the news to really get the picture? Um, maybe one long form article a, a week is enough. Your friends will tell you what's going on too. Um, and to uh, so so I think that's helpful. Like as as a, as practitioners, it, we have a responsibility to keep our minds hot, bright because that's really where we can make a difference. Um, and just to use that to balance out how much stimulus of certain kinds we're taking, and to recognize when being informed, quote unquote, just becomes being entertained and actually feeding off of it. That's a that's not that hard to get a feel for. Um, actually, and um, then to spread uh, loving kindness um, in as much as you're able. That's if my teacher once said that if he would, could recommend a 10 minute practice to basically if moderns and westerners spread 10 minutes of metta at the beginning of each meditation practice, that would be really, really uh, like a very good practice for them. And Honestly, if you don't have much time to meditate, but you have time for 10 minutes of loving kindness a day, that's huge. Um, but I'd say in a Buddhist conception, like the quality of loving kindness is more important than the target. And, you know, I often like to keep that going towards distant folks is, is quite hard. So, you know, maintaining it towards, towards yourself and uh, maybe you need that or the people close to you. And just acknowledging that in each Buddhist list, there's a representative of wisdom. And in the Brahma Viharas, the states of loving kindness, the fourth is the representative of wisdom is equipoise, upekka, and equanimity. And so there's a place of stepping back. Like if we can't make a difference at this moment, if we are finding our hearts darkened by it, then um, maybe we need to consume the news in that particular realm less. And also to contextualize how much human suffering there's been through throughout history. It's easy to find an event and be like, oh my God, this is a unique moment in history. We are, we have, there is tragedy and there, and it's not to cheapen the tragedy, but I think it does help to kind of expand the view a little bit and see that, that things are, things are like this. They're broken. Um, and we do our best to bless it and, and to, to hold it with wisdom. But I think that widening vision can also be helpful. Did that, does that address it at all? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Aya, did you have anything to add to that? Okay, I think we have to wrap stuff up. Um, is anyone else is having trouble with the, the news this week a little bit? Yeah. And, and spreading loving kindness to all those involved is, is really good. And uh, yeah, that's something that we can do. But maybe if you have a New York Times subscription, you could just not check it five times a day, you know, something like that.